Recording in progress. I'm glad they told us. <clears throat> Good evening. Hello, my name is Dana Garvis. I run Oregon Brew Lab, which is an analysis facility for brewers who need quality control or government documentation. Uh, I also am at heart a teacher. And so once a month, um, I try to put together a, an interesting presentation about something that fascinates me or something that I do daily that I think is really cool um, and that people could use a greater understanding. So I like to use um, my, my teaching skills to try and get beer uh, science education out into the world. Um, I call this a fireside chat. I have my little uh, propane torch on behind me for the fire. Uh, you can't really see it because it, it burns pretty hot. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about how to determine microbe identity using gram stains um, and hopefully using these tricks and methods that I've accumulated over the past decade, uh, you'll be able to avoid any fake IDs. Uh, we don't like fake IDs in the beer industry. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what inspires me about gram staining. Um, we'll go into the history for a second. Uh, and then we're gonna spend a bulk of the time talking about the process of identifying microbes. And then we'll hit my favorite part, which is probably um, the best part, which is looking at really cool microbe photos um, that I've collected over the years. And then lastly, if you have any questions about um, what I'm up to, we'll save that for the end. So to me, ground staining is really scientifically cool. I think that the process and the way that each individual piece works, uh, it is just like really elegant and really easy. I think that it's something that anyone with just the most minute of science backgrounds is able to run and do this um, identity test. Uh, it's fun and pretty, kind of like tie-dye. It has really, really nice colors um, that make little microbes pop and, and seem really awesome in contrast. Uh, and then, oh right, it also helps us identify beer spoilers, which is incredibly useful um, for process control within the brewery. So this is Hans Christian Graham, uh, not to be confused with Hans Gruber. Uh, he went to the University of Copenhagen for a degree in bacteriology. After he graduated, uh, he moved to Berlin and started working in a morgue. And there he developed a technique for gram staining, uh, which is, is uh, named after him. Uh, and so looking at sort of a historical perspective, um, Austrian R, this guy down here um, in 1960, did sort of a little history of the gram stain and, and revealed that he, that Graham originally didn't create this method for the purpose of identifying types of bacteria. All he wanted to do was be able to see the bacteria under the microscope much easier. And so that makes sense because this is what bacteria or Saccharomyces looks like under a microscope. You can tell those individual cells, but it would be significantly easier if there was a color there to show that bright contrast. And so using crystal violet, we can actually do that and make this, this pop a whole lot more. Now we use modern technology, modern microscopes, but in you know 1884, uh, this color difference would have been a world of difference. Whereas I think with modern day computing and um, mic microscopy, uh, we're able to get really good photos. He also was ever dedicated scientist who is full of doubt and concerned about error. And so he himself said that he thinks that this method could use some improvements, that, that it's something other scientists will take and improve upon his methods. And it turns out, ever the scientist, that he was right. Uh, originally, he used Bismarck Brown as a counter stain, um, which is actually really, really good at staining cells, so much so that it stains your skin relatively permanently for a few weeks if it gets on you. And so we don't really use that anymore. In fact, I couldn't even find it to purchase it to test it out for this presentation. Um, what we use now is safranin, which is a red stain. And so one of the reasons we didn't like Bismarck Brown was because the way that the stain stuck to the slide. 
So these individual little browned flecks, that, those are the actual microbes using Bismarck Brown. And I had to steal this from the internet because I couldn't do it myself. But you can see that all this noise here from this counter stain on the slide makes it even more difficult to tell these apart. Well, so that's why we use Safran and look at this super, super clean grab where the, the slide itself has been stained slightly pink, but overall you can tell these individual bacilli um, that come from this group of bacteria called Zimmermonas. All right, as I was saying before we started recording, uh, bacteria ID um, is sort of all encompassing and gram staining was something that I initially wanted to focus on, but realized that there was sort of this um, greater puzzle that I was missing. And so in order to get the full puzzle, you don't wanna just look at the pretty colors. You need to construct the frame. You need to um, identify different pieces and put them all together. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk through the different puzzle pieces it takes to identify microbes. Uh, including how to gram stain um, so that at the end of this talk, hopefully you feel comfortable uh, doing this in your own lab. So the first piece of this puzzle is your growth environment and the speed at which it grows. And that's relatively easy. Uh, aerobic means grown in the presence of oxygen, aero meaning oxygen, big from bios or life. So needing oxygen for life. And then we have anaerobic, which is anti or anti without. So without oxygen for life, this is bacteria that can grow without oxygen. And those two things really um, separate out a lot of different bacteria that can grow in beer because um, beer itself doesn't actually have any oxygen in it available for bacteria. So if something is able to grow in an anaerobic environment, it's also able to grow in beer. Um, and then we look at speed, which is a really easy thing to jot down in your observations. And that's just the number of days it's taken from the moment you inoculate the plate to when you first see growth. And so it's important to check every day when you're plating. Now, if your, your plating setup allows for you to use a media that does differential staining, I highly recommend it. This is WLD media, it's blue. And it turns yellow with the presence of an acid. So if a bacteria produces an acid, that change will be reflected uh, in the color. So we've got this first example of this plate that had this, uh, we'll say, cannon-shaped uh, <laughs> bacteria that has no yellow halo around it. So this is not an acid-producing beer or acid producing bacteria, excuse me. Uh, whereas this bacteria is acid producing because we have this yellow halo around these colonies. So if you can identify that uh, bacteria has produced acid or not, that helps you start to put that puzzle together. The next thing that we're gonna look at and make observations for is what does that colony on that growth plate, what does that actually look like? Are they tiny little dots like that second photo I showed you or are they round circular more like that first photo? Um, if it's filamous, it's probably more of a mold type item. And if it's in a regular form, you probably have multiple bacteria in there that are fighting for different shapes. We generally don't see rhizoids um, in beer and spindles you will see if you do pour plates as opposed to streak plates. Um, but uh, generally these are the two that we're gonna, we're gonna see in the brewing industry. Um, and then go ahead and just like tilt that plate a little bit, look at it head on and uh, determine just how much of a raise and elevation those morphologies have. And that's something you just wanna jot down as part of notes as you're going. All right, let's get to the gram staining, the, the meat of it really. Um, we're gonna talk about all these different steps as we go. The first one is we're going to affix bacteria from, from a colony to a glass slide. Don't need sound. All right, so um, let's pull that up. Come on. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, oh, wait for the video to load. 
Ooh, maybe I made it mad. Oh, good. Apologies. Okay, we're staying in small form. <laughs> that works fine. So the first thing we're gonna do, um, I did it off camera, was we're gonna take, we're gonna take this uh, glass slide. Oh, why is it fighting me so hard? <laughs> there we go. We're going to take this glass slide, we're going to clean it with ethanol, and then we're going to let it dry. And once it's dry, we'll be able to move forward. What you just missed, because the video is really upset with me, is up here flaming uh, the loop um, and getting it white hot so it's sterilized. After it's sterilized, we're going to capture a little bit of deionized water that's going on in this uh, corner here. Uh, where you capture just a little bit of the deionized water at the end of the loop, which has now been sterilized. You're gonna place that on the slide and sort of blot that water in. We're gonna go back and flame the loop end just one more time because we're gonna use it to capture some of that colony. Um, but first what we're gonna wanna do before capturing the colony is place that hot loop on the media itself to sort of remove that heat. Then we're gonna go back in and scrape just a tiny, tiny little bit of the colony and move that onto the blotted water. And then we're gonna just kind of smear that colony all around. We want a really thin layer so that we get clear images of single cells. And one of the things that I didn't stick around and wait to film for on this video was that we're gonna let that slide dry completely. And once it's dry, we're gonna heat affix the bacteria to the slide by facing the bacteria away from the flame and running the slide through the heat. What that does is that makes sure that the bacteria hangs onto the glass while getting rinsed of the stains. All right. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that slide and we're gonna flood it with crystal violet for about two to three minutes. Now, this setup that I have here is for breweries without a sink. You can just use a, or brewery labs without a sink or access easily to a sink. Um, you're gonna use a way boat to run this whole operation and run your rinses and stuff through it. So we're gonna let that sit for about two to three minutes, rinse it with deionized water. And what that does is the crystal violet will bind to cells and the cell walls. Then we're gonna stain it with stabilized iodine. Stabilized iodine then grabs onto that crystal violet and onto the cell wall and makes it a permanent bridge. It brings them together. And the thicker the cell wall, the better the binding on that iodine. Uh, if it's a thin wall, that's, an, that's a cell that we're going to be able to then decolorize, remove that, that dark purple color with a mixture of alcohol and isopropyl alcohol. I've seen lots of different ratios of this used. I've even seen just isopropyl or just alcohol used. So I don't think it's super important which you have. Um, as long as it's able to, to remove the iodine and crystal violet from the cells. And that only takes about 30 seconds to completely break those bonds on the thin celled walls. So then we're gonna rinse again with DI and counter stain with safranin. Uh, we're gonna let that sit again for two to three minutes before we rinse and let the slide dry. And just really quick, we're gonna walk through that whole setup. So right there, we have the crystal violet already on. We're rinsing it and you can see here, I have three different uh, slides going. Each slide has three to four uh, different bacteria colonies on it. So then we're gonna do our stabilized iodine, let that sit two to three minutes. Then we're gonna come back with DI water and rinse that off. Yeah, there it goes. Next up is the decolorizer. And that's just a quick 30 seconds again. Rinse it with DI. And lastly, we're gonna hit it strong with that safranin, that really bright red color uh, dye. Then again, let it rinse, let it dry. Um, I set them on a uh, fiber-free wipe. So like a Kim wipe just to let them dry. Sometimes I'll set them in the incubation if I need to go faster um, so that it, it will dry out. Now, once those are dry, we're gonna throw them under the microscope and look at the color. Uh, and the color is gonna tell us whether or not it is a gram positive 
or gram negative bacteria. And this like separates uh, beer bacteria into really nice separate groups. Excuse me, that beer's um, loud. Uh, and we're gonna um, determine its uh, gram stain result. So without the stain, clusters like these, tiny, tiny little cocci, which is what they're called, are impossible to determine. This could be Pediococcus, this could be Megasphera. There are a bunch of different bacteria that this could be without knowing anything but the form. Luckily for us, bacteria is easily differentiated when it's gram positive or gram negative. So this is uh, gram positive bacteria over here, Pediococcus. You can see very tiny, they form these little tetrads. Um, sometimes they form these uh, chains. And then on this side, we have Megasphera, uh, much more pink. Um, and you can see it also forms tetrads, but it doesn't really tend to form uh, strings so much. You can see there's a three, three pointer right there. Um, but generally we see Megasphera in individuals or uh, occasionally tetrads. Which brings me to slide here, uh, puzzle piece number four, cell morphology. And that's just what shape is the cell that you see under the microscope? Is it round? That's cocci. If is it, is it uh, oblong and thin? That's bacillus. Now we also have in beer different curved rods. There's some lactobacillus and um, different molds that can either be curved or be stringy like this. Uh, paleomorphic bacteria can exist in the beer industry, but it is very uncommon. Um, so here it is just as an acknowledgement, but um, thank you, we don't, these things can't really live in beer very well. Then we're going to look at the cell arrangement for puzzle piece number five. And what that is, is that's those tetrads that I was talking about with the pediococcus and the megasphera, um, or the chains that you can sometimes see form. And this is just different uh, terminology for the way that they cluster, right? So um, staphylococci is when we have little uh, random clusters. Staphylococci is when we have these uh, strings. And we also have the staphylobacilli. Uh, which is chains of lactobacillus. And so we're just going to make note of all of these things to help us figure out this bigger picture of what is this bacteria. So one last uh, video test that I'm going to walk you through is the catalase test. So this one's really awesome, really easy. Uh, when I needed to run this for a brewery that I worked for, I literally had to run to the 7-Eleven down the street to purchase hydrogen peroxide, um, which luckily they have. You can run this directly on the plate, or you can run it on a slide like I'm doing. I, I like to keep my plates pristine until results have been sent. Um, and so I'll just grab colonies instead of, of doing it on there. But what we're going to do is we're going to just squirt just a few drops of store-bought hydrogen peroxide right there on the colony. And then um, past me, we'll zoom in eventually. Uh, but there we go. What we're gonna see for catalase positive bacteria is a really rapid production of bubbles. We're gonna see oxygen gas forming before our eyes. And that's because of the way that the cell walls are breaking down and what it releases, which is oxygen gas and a little bit of water. And you can see that we've really puffed up here. I think it'll resolve in just a second. Come on me. Well, good enough, look at those bubbles. Um, it's really, really foaming. And so we know that that's catalase positive. And there are some bacteria where the only way to tell, because all the other metrics are the same, is this catalase test. So this is the final puzzle piece I use to determine bacteria identities. All right. So we talked about the growth environment. Is it anaerobic or anaerobic? Uh, how quickly did it grow? Um, and does it, when it's growing, produce an acid? We like to look at what shape it grows into, and then we look at whether or not it's gram positive or gram negative. While we're under the microscope looking at our gram results, uh, we also want to make note of the morphology, the shape of those cells, and how they interact with each other, how they self-arrange. And lastly, we're going to see how they interact with hydrogen peroxide. 
So what you do with all that information is you go to a flow chart of brewing bacteria. Now, this is one that I made that I use that sort of guides my um, decision tree when I'm, when I'm trying to figure out what is what. Um, I do have this available on my website under the media tab, also under the um, blog tab if you want to follow this, but we'll just take a second to look at it. So this is where we start. And the way that I have this designed is we have aerobic bacteria on the left and anaerobic bacteria on the right. Uh, then we determine whether or not there was acid produced during growth, and that's these blue ones up here, acid producing versus non-acid producing down here. Uh, what's great about this flow chart is if you don't know if your bacteria is acid producing or not, you still can follow this flow to gram negative or gram positive and stay within your lanes here. Um, once you have determined whether it's gram negative or gram positive on both ends, uh, you determine whether it's a uh, cocci or a rod or bacillus. Um, and then uh, in some cases, such as this one over here, a catalase test will tell you whether or not it's one bacteria or another. In this case, um, whether or not it's lactobacillus or bacteria. Uh So this is something you can download a PDF of on my website. Um, go ahead and check it out. All right, so PICS or GTFO, um, I'm, I feel you. All right, this is a progression of gram stained yeast. This is just a Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae, not super exciting, just really round cells. This is, you know, with no stain. This is that crystal violet where it's kind of bright neon purple. Uh, with the iodine, we then have uh, it turned kind of almost purple black, kind of loses that um, UV sort of element. And then with safranin on a gram positive bacteria like yeast, uh, it's not going to change the cells themselves, but it is going to kind of stain the slide a little bit to this kind of um, pinkish color. And uh, I really like this photo progression because it is very difficult to run a slide through the microscope, then stain it, then rinse it, then dry it, and then get the exact same photo. So I did that four times and I'm really proud of myself. So that's, that's a very cool photo, um, even if it doesn't necessarily show it uh, at first look. Um, going deeper, we can actually look at the difference between an ale yeast and a lager yeast. Ale yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, right here is very round and circular and sphere-like whereas lager yeast tends to be more um, ovid or egg-shaped, sometimes lemon-shaped. Um, I remember the very first time my IPA heavy brewery was doing a Pilsner and I was brand new to the industry and I was doing a cell count. And the moment I saw the lager yeast under there, I called my boss and I was like, we can't pitch this, something's wrong with this yeast. Uh, and he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, we're, we're doing a Pilsner. So um, if, if you're ever worried, uh, just remember that story. Uh, one of the ways that you can really improve your um, photo taking of different bacteria under a scope is to add mineral oil uh, between the slide and your lens. So this is at 125 magnification um, and it gets really, really blurry. That's because between the glass where the bacteria is sitting and the lens of the microscope, you've got air in between those two layers. So if we remove that air layer by adding something that's similar to glass, like mineral oil, uh, you actually reduce that refractive index and you get a much, much clearer picture. Um, and you also can pick up some color. So I've been showing you very healthy, happy yeast. This is actually what unhappy, unhealthy yeast looks like. Um, this is a very cool photo. I think it's one of my coolest. Um, this lager yeast had autolyzed and started having interesting off flavors. Um, and so the brewery contacted me to do a micro analysis and we determined that this yeast was cannibalizing itself. And what's really cool about this photo is right here where you kind of have these little, little wings, these claws almost, that's literally the cell wall of the yeast broken open. Uh, and you can see that it's having a hard time 
hanging on to any sort of dye. This one right here almost has a little bit of safranin in it. Um, but you can tell that uh, there's only one or two actually healthy yeasts in here. And uh, what's also cool is this cell right here uh, was in the middle of budding. That's what this extra little growth is. And so this growth is doing okay, but the original cell is, is dying. It's pretty cool. Uh, as a size comparison to show you uh, how we can tell different stuff apart when they're the same um, cell uh, morphology is this is a uh, Cerevisiae, let's see, no, 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 I'm sorry. This is a Saccharomyces epistramus, uh, which is a lager yeast next to Megasphera. And you can see the huge difference, even though they both technically are cocci because they're round, um, the size difference is how we can tell that difference. Um, this is a, a picture of a beer from way long ago, and I'm glad because I, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but this was a hot, hot mess. I mean, look at this. We have long chains of lactobacillus here. We have short chains of lactobacillus, another strain here. Uh, we have some megasphera. Uh, kind of all over the place. And then we have little bits of Brett kind of floating uh, around. And there's even a little Brett molecule right here. So um, these are the most interesting. They're also the most stressful because um, it's hard to know what went wrong when so many things have gone wrong. Uh, I think that uh, stuff like gram staining is really fun and interesting because we can take it further for certain uh, genuses such as lactobacillus. We can use uh, the cell shape to actually determine your species. So this first one is lactobacillus brevis. It generally is uh, thin long rods that are straight. Occasionally there's a little bit of bend um, and sometimes they like to chain. Uh, Lactobacillus plantarum is a little bit shorter, squatter, but it creates these little butterflies, these little tetrads, um, and you can see them sort of trying to form in lots of areas in this photo. Uh, and then uh, Lactobacillus uh, bucneri uh, tends to be a little smaller, a little shorter, uh, and it tends to be end heavy so that it curves a little bit on the edges here. Um, and so I think that uh, just being able to identify species a little bit further for some bacteria such as Lactobacillus is really excellent. Now we can't do this, unfortunately, for something like Bretomyces. It is way too complex. So these three photos are pictures of Bretomyces that I have found from, from my clients sending samples in. And we can see that these are uh, small, like, uh, like, <laughs> like a Bretomyces, uh, they're smaller than, um, smaller than Saccharomyces, definitely bigger than Pediococcus or Megasphera. So there's, um, really nothing else for this to be, but Bretomyces. Uh, same with this one. This one has these like kind of rod like shapes, uh, but it's definitely not lactobacillus. It didn't produce acid, uh, and it was able to grow, uh, in an oxygen rich environment which lactobacillus cannot. So this, uh, this is a really interesting Bretomyces. And then lastly, we have this kind of in-between round and in-between uh, rod-like shape that's much more elliptical and um, similar to yeast, but not quite because look at this sort of like teardrop shape. So these are uh, Bretomyces found in the wild, we'll say. This next slide is uh, commercial pitches of Bretomyces. So this is from purchased from the homebrew shop, brought into the lab, plated. Um, this first one is uh, Bruxillus. Um, it has that kind of small, almost pointed shape that we saw in that first round. Uh, this is Lambicus. Uh, I have never seen a, a Brett strain come in my lab that looks like this. Uh, if I saw it, I would think initially that it's a lactobacillus. Um, so I find that rather fascinating. Um, and then this last one is a Bretois um, that's a mix of three different Bretomyces. And I've spent quite some time sort of staring at this being like, can I identify three different um, shapes in there? 
and I'm still not sure. I think if I if I spent more time or if I talked it through with someone, perhaps, but um, it's a little bit more difficult to tell. So generally, I do not try to provide information on species identification for Brettomyces. Um, generally, breweries mostly just care that something got infected with Brett as itself. And lastly, I want to close out with one uh, super weird bacteria that I do not find in beer. Um, I found this in a plum cider uh, and was very shocked. So this is Clostridium. It's not a very safe bacteria to have in your final product. Uh, this uh, client ended up pasteurizing their samples, so we're all good. Uh, this all got killed. But what's fascinating about this is this bowling pin shape. Uh, we just don't see this in beer. This uh, particular bacteria really, really struggles to live in beer, um, which is why I only was able to find it in a cider. But um, I think some of these shapes are just fantastic. I mean, uh, ma imagine my surprise when I, when I first get my eyes on that under the microscope. Um, that was an uncomfortable phone call. Alrighty, um, now I want to go ahead and open it up if there's any questions um, from the participants. I'm going to stop this for the chat. Yeah. Let me take a sip real quick. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Hey, thanks for all this. This was great a lot of a lot of good information here um and i appreciate you know kind of just all your your kind of notes going through it too just kind of your experiences you know those little nuggets are you know super helpful um as someone who's kind of you know newly getting into this um trying to help out a local brewery uh and just you know kind of establishing some qa you know protocols throughout their process um some of like the basic stuff um they've got a lot of uh, <laughs> A lot of lab stuff that's probably outdated as far as uh you know not to go down another path but ph you know they've got a, obviously like four or five gallon you know you know jugs of ph uh solution that's you know 2017 2018 yeah <laughs> being used to calibrate but i was wondering you know as far as like even di water and cleaning your di water equipment is there something particular you're using is that just the same ethanol that you're using to clean slides with so good question. I use a deionized water that's purchased. So I buy it by the gallon um, just to make things easier. Um, is it sterilized? It should be technically, um, but I don't think that there's anything that can live in your DI water though, unless it's actively molding. Um, I don't think it would uh, like affect a gram, a gram slide if you were to okay. rinse. Um, I have absolutely in the past, uh, when working with breweries that were budget constricted, we'll say, um, who've just used tap water and that, that works. I mean, uh, one of the reasons why we affix the bacteria to the slide with heat is because anything that gets on there is just going to slide off when you do another rinse. So I got uh, you. Okay. that should, that should counteract it. Um, and in terms of the ethanol I use, I actually just run down to the Home Depot and buy denatured alcohol. And that's what I use for my alcohol cleaning uh, when it comes to micro uh, aseptic techniques. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what else did I have here? I kind of went, I had some questions on Brett, but those last couple slides, sure. seemed they, they touched on it all. I can't. I you got a lot of info on Brett there, which is good. And yet at the same time, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think Brett is definitely a weak point. Which slide would you like to look at? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think these guys right here where they're all kind of punched in. So is so the, the staining process for all three of these is the same, but the ones on the left, is that just, you're just getting a little bit of like, uh, um, I don't even know what, like ghosting, which is kind of affecting the color or are they still the same color? So um, 
Okay, so you're asking about this like particularly bright purple versus this kind of black. Purple. Exactly. Yeah, so um, that's a little bit of uh, movie magic, we'll say. When I have a good slide or a good stain, I will go back and re uh, restain it with just the crystal violet so that I get this nice pop. Um, so I've oh, already determined okay. that there's nothing else on the slide that will turn pink. Um, so I'll go back and run it again so that I get the better photo. I gotcha. Okay. Good question. Good catch too. <laughs> my, my normal day career involves, you know, looking at cars and picking out, you know, if a lug nut's different. So. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. When I put my, you know, head down and actually look at this stuff, it's kind of fun to you know, see what my eyes yeah. pick up. So like, for example, with this Bretois, um, once mm -hmm. I saw that there was still some artifacts of pink in there, um, I wouldn't go back and like restain it. Okay. And now if you, if you've got, uh, I don't know, let's say a Bret, a Bret and Sack mix where, you know, you're, you're thinking there might've been some autolysis or something, you know, it's been on, it's been on the yeast for a long time. Would this, would the stain come out similar to that where the cells just don't hold the pigment because the, the, the cell wall is broken? Yes, yes. So if, if, uh, if any sort of pitch, whether it's uh, Saccharomyces or Bretomyces, which is a very close relative to Saccharomyces, uh, if it is experiencing autolysis, like it will, have difficulty hanging on to that stained color. Um, uh, that's really the only time that I really see um, yeast or bread act um, as though they're unable to hold color, but it's both stains that it's unable to hold on to, right? Mm -hmm. um, generally, you wouldn't see Saccharomyces ever hold on to uh, safranin. Okay. Good to know, good to know. Any other questions? I'm looking through all my, my chicken scratch here, seeing what I've got. <laughs> Uh, you had mentioned uh, WLD as a media yes. uh, for acid producing bacteria. Yes. So this is WLD. Yes. Yeah, is, is this something that you're creating in house or are you buying these like a pre? Yes. So I purchased the dry powdered media um, and then I rehydrate it. And I actually have a whole talk on how to prepare that media. Mm -hmm. Um from January that you can find on my website. Um, yeah, so WLD is one example and it's one that I use because it really helps uh, distinguish and identify um, Saccharomyces from Bretomyces, but then also Pediococcus and Lactobacillus grow quite well in them. Um, okay. and, and when they grow, they do produce this, this halo. Interesting, okay. Um, let's see. I think there's another, I can't remember what the other medium is, but there is another medium that, um, will change from, I think a pink to a yellow, or maybe it's the other way around, uh, in the presence of acid as well. So there's a, there's a couple of options out there. Um, if you are a member of the, uh, American society for brewing chemists, they have a whole, uh, process that you can find, um, that discusses the pros and cons to different beer medias. Um, I also highly recommend uh, s2media.com. They are a small woman-owned business out of Spokane, Washington that provide pre-poured plates um, in a sleeve of 10 that you can throw in your fridge or your freezer, depending on the media. Um, and they're really affordable. They ship in two days. Uh, they're really awesome. So um, if you don't have the ability to take, to aseptically take powdered media to plated media, um, 
pre-purchased plates, S S2 Media is the way to go. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that's, you know, coming into a lab that's, you know, very bare bones, it's super helpful to, you know, not have to try to create something in-house. Yeah. In Spokane. My parents live there at some point. <laughs> My parents currently live there. That's funny. Nice. Okay, so let's get to this very last one. All right, so um, thank you both for joining tonight. Um, my next fireside chat will be June 17th, barring uh, Oregon Brewers Awards or being very sick for my second vaccination, um, which is what happened with the last two talks. So uh, please join me for a discussion about beer color, um, which is totally a super real measurement. Um, I say that with, uh, quite a bit of sarcasm because it is a real measurement, but, um, we're going to kind of dive into how valid of a measurement is it. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks, Dana. 